All right, so it's good to be back. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it looks like I brought the uh, warm weather with me from LA. Not really, but um, again, it's good to be back uh, and see uh, friends and colleagues. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of our work that we did develop while I was here. Uh, I left uh, Northwestern about two years ago, uh, but I still collaborate quite a bit with a lot of the faculty here, particularly in chemistry. And we'll talk about how we're using nano diamonds uh, for both imaging and drug delivery. And so here you have an image of a nano diamond, and it has this unique truncated octahedral structure that's resulted in some pretty interesting enhancements to both how we deliver drugs, how we load drugs, and in particular, how we do uh, medical imaging. And uh, through both experimental as well as some modeling work, which we'll talk about, we've looked at how these facets contribute to these unique properties um, that I think um, lend to some of the translational applications that we're working on. And so today, I'm gonna talk about some of our fundamental work, some of our translational work with collaborators, and also where we're going with the nano diamond and the current progress we have uh, with its translation towards the clinic. So not long ago, a colleague of uh, mine and I published a paper looking at basically what was the most comprehensive view of nanomaterial translation into the clinic for both therapy and imaging. And in that review, we highlighted um, a lot of the basic requirements that we think are important for moving a particle from A to Z all the way towards the clinic. Um, and this article also looked at pretty much every single clinical trial number out there pertaining to nano and the current progress of each of those studies. Some of the material properties that are important include scalability. There are a lot of materials that are being developed, um, and right now they're at the process of trying to refine how these materials are synthesized, characterized into a stage where they can be made at levels that are high enough for clinical translation, but also stable and consistent enough with regards to size, surface charge, et cetera. And so this is a critical area. And why we work with nano diamond is because nano diamonds are essentially byproducts of ball milling um, and refining of waste materials that arise from refining and mining operations all over the world. It's basically soil, it's dirt. And by taking this dirt and using very simple cleaning and breaking up processes, we can actually yield particles that are about four to five nanometers per particle. There's some clustering that occurs, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Good loading capacity and sustained release profiles. Um, these are basic properties that uh, nanoparticles, as they move towards the clinic, they need to have because you wanna see specific improvements to treatment efficacy and safety. And again, this is something that I'll talk about more in a little bit. And also you want something that's a platform technology with a caveat, right? You want a material that can deliver a broad range of compounds so that it can treat a broad range of diseases. However, if you look at the current cost of new drug development, ranging from several hundred million dollars to a billion dollars, eventually this will lead to a narrowing down of identifying a specific indication or maybe just a couple indications for a particle as you move towards a clinic. I can publish a hundred papers in my group of different possible applications of nano diamonds for medicine, but I'm not gonna have a hundred times one billion dollars of funding to go and try to move every single indication into the clinic. And so through working with nano diamond, and we've worked with other materials like polymerosomes, nanotubes, and so on and so forth, I think that as we converge into the clinic, there are specific nanoparticles that are better for specific indications in therapy and imaging, all right? And so, I'll tell you right now, nano diamonds are not great for delivering any drug out there, all right? For some drugs, other particles work better. And so today I'm gonna to focus actually on the use of nano diamonds for anthracycline delivery, as well as magnetic <clears throat> resonance imaging contrast agent synthesis, where those are areas that I think that nano diamonds are in a position to make a more unique contribution into the clinic. So as I just mentioned, we publish more um, on work looking at nanodiamond for delivery of epirubicin, doxorubicin, donorubicin, and these are very widely used cancer drugs for indications in leukemia, liver cancer, breast cancer, so on and so forth. And then in collaboration with Tom Mead's group here at Northwestern, we've done some pretty interesting work looking at diamond gadolinium hybrids for MR contrast agents. So today I'm really just gonna talk a little bit about this and a little bit of recent work that we did in the ophthalmology area. 
and then primarily focus on some of our translational work that we've done in collaboration with folks here at Northwestern, uh, UC San Francisco, and UCLA. All right, so just a brief outline of what we're looking at. I'm going to talk a little bit about some in vitro work, primarily with how we first did some functionalization of nanodiamonds with drugs, really what led us uh, to use nanodiamonds for drug delivery, some MRI studies, and some very recent work looking at localized therapy. The second part of the talk will focus primarily on our animal work, and I also will discuss kind of our translation towards large animal and eventually clinical studies. So we have looked at nanodiamonds for the delivery of a broad range of compounds, and it's this work here that led us to really focus on nanodiamond anthracycline delivery as well as MR. Right, so I've shown you this work over here. Now let's look at delivery of proteins. Not long ago, we published a study looking at nanodiamond delivery of insulin, not for diabetes applications, but for potential wound healing applications. And we found that under pH-specific conditions, which are indic indicative of bacterial infection, which is associated with serious burns, as an example, we're able to deliver insulin as a potential provascularization agent to accelerate wound healing. We've delivered other therapeutic proteins and antibodies for cancer applications like the TGF, TGF beta antibody. So this is an area that was pretty interesting. One area that we encountered here was that the particles were pretty large. They were well in excess of a couple hundred nanometers. The work was interesting, uh, but we've continued work to look at dispersing these particles to make them more stable. We've done some DNA, uh, siRNA delivery. We found that with nanodiamonds that were polymer functionalized, we could get a 70-fold enhancement in transfection efficacy without sacrificing safety. And then in collaboration with Horacio Espinoza's group in mechanical engineering here, his team developed a very unique uh, microfluidic AFM tip, where we were able to do single cell injection of nanodiamonds to trap where they go. We could pattern nanodiamonds on surfaces. We were making a lot of devices that were implantable uh, with nanodiamonds to slow drug release, and we were able to spatially control where we, we could put nanodiamonds with drugs as well as imaging agents. And then finally, we've also looked at targeted nanodiamond imaging, some of which I'll talk about today. And again, through all of this work and looking at you know, delivering different drugs. We've probably today delivered about 20 different therapeutic compounds. Some work better than others. Some are not as easy to solubilize when using nanodiamond compared to other materials. And so this is what's really led us to MR and anthracycline delivery. All right, so about five years ago, in collaboration again with Tom Mead's group in chemistry, we took GAD3 or gadolinium-3 and we covalently linked it to the nanodiamond surface. And we saw at the time was a huge increase in per gadolinium relaxivity or brightness. Now, looking at the use of nanomaterials to deliver imaging agents, there are a lot of groups that are trying to load as much imaging agent as you can into or onto a nanoparticle to make something that's as bright as possible. And it sounds logical, right? If you take what's like a little nano lantern, in this case, gadolinium, and you pack as much as you can onto or into a particle, naturally it will be brighter, right? But the issue here is if the whole goal is to overload, you can use a lot of different particles to achieve that. But another issue is toxicity, right? These particles can be, or these imaging agents can be toxic. If you load a lot of something onto a particle, you have something that's very bright, but also potentially very toxic. What we found with nanodiamond gadolinium was that when we have this truncated octahedral architecture that I showed you in that first slide, our group and other groups have found that there's alternating electrostatics on the surface of this particle that pulls water or coordin coordinates water around the surface of that diamond. Gadolinium needs water to function. It's like the fuel for gadolinium to function. So in here, you don't, you're not just simply using the nanoparticle as a substrate to load something onto. The nanoparticle is actually actively doing something to help the imaging agent function better. And so what we saw at the time was pretty astounding. We saw a per gadolinium increase of relaxivity of about 12-fold, and this is actually a little bit higher now, right? So we're not trying to get an imaging agent that's 12 times brighter. We're hoping to add 1 12th the amount of gadolinium to the patient while still getting the required contrast information out. 
Right? And so if that's achievable, if we can have an order of magnitude drop in imaging agent dosing for a patient, that could be a game-changing advance. And so we've since moved beyond this to add targeted gadolinium imaging agents. Not long ago, together with Tom's group, we found huge increases in gadolinium uptake with the nanoparticles. And so when you couple all of this together, again, our goal that is something that's relevant for the clinic is to decrease the GAD dose for the patient. And this is something that Tom's group has tried with a number of different nanomaterial agents. And this is among the highest ever reported per GAD relaxivities compared to every nanoparticle agent as well as all clinical agents. All right, moving on through additional work looking at exploring how nanodiamonds are interesting. About uh, six months ago, we published a paper using nanodiamonds uh, for drug delivery uh, for anti-glaucoma in a contact lens. And so what we did here is we synthesized a diamond-based nanogel that's chitosin-based, um, acetylated chitosin, uh, to make a nanogel where when this gel comes into contact with lysozyme, which is an enzyme found in tears, this actually triggers the release of timolol, which is a drug that's commonly used to deal with glaucoma. And timolol is often found uh, in, in eye drops, and patient adherence is an issue there because eye drops are not comfortable, and sometimes the drug dosing is not accurate, and then patient adherence uh, to eye drops is an issue. If they don't adhere to this treatment regimen, blindness can happen. And so we were thinking, you know what, can we add diamonds into a contact lens matrix, disperse the diamonds well enough so that the required minimum levels of optical clarity are preserved, and can we also use lysozyme to trigger drug release? There are groups that are using contact lenses with drugs that are imprinted on the lens or that are soaked in a drug, but the issue there is burst release. What happens is when this stuff comes into contact with liquid, the drug, 99% of it just falls off, right? And so there are some issues with that, such as infection and other complications, uh, but the issue here is you just don't want that drug to all disappear within a few hours. And again, contact lenses are most often stored in liquid. So you don't want this stuff to be stored in liquid and to have drugs just start releasing and have none of it go to the patient. And so that's why triggered release was a goal that we had. And so here um, is one of our lens prototypes. Beyond just uh, improving you know, drug release profiles, we know that when you use nanodiamond to make a composite, you can actually improve the mechanical properties of whatever that composite is. And so we found that the lens was more resistant to tearing um, in terms of drug release, we compared our lens with drug soaked as well as molecularly imprinted lenses. And here you see this characteristic burst release. Very quickly upon exposure to liquid, most of the drug is gone. However, with our nano diamond gel lens, you can see that upon exposure to lysozyme, the drug is actually released. Another reason why we use nano diamond, because you can do this with other nanoparticles, is that we know that nanodiamonds interact well with water, right? And so interacting well with water, uh, we want the lens oxygen content and water permeability to be at an adequate level so that wear comfort is preserved for the patient. And so that's another reason why we were using nanodiamonds for this application. So we're gonna move towards larger animal studies in the near future, but that was kind of a neat study that my student did to see what other applications we could do with the nanodiamond, where we can actually harness its unique interaction with water. All right, so now let's move on to some of our preclinical work in translation and see uh, where we're headed with regards to moving this towards the clinic. So a couple years ago, we published a paper, um, and this was that same figure that you saw looking at nanodiamonds bound to doxorubicin, very widely used cancer drug, very potent at killing cancer cells, also very toxic, right, because there's no specificity for how it breaks up DNA to kill cells. We found a few years back, uh, in 2007, when I first arrived at Northwestern, that when we reversibly bind DOC to the diamond surface, um, it quasi-silences that drug. And not only that, the drug very potently binds to the surface of the diamond, almost to the point where it's actually very slow to desorb off. And that's good, as I'll show you in a little bit, with regards to administering this drug in a systemic fa fashion to prevent toxicity. Right, so we look at different drug, uh, cancer models. Uh, drug resistance is one area that comes to mind. And for drug resistance, DOX is a drug that a lot of different tumors are resistant to. So for this particular study, we looked at two, two situations. One was drug-resistant breast cancer, and one was drug-resistant 
liver cancer. For those unfamiliar with resistance, one mode of resistance occurs when the drug, you know, normally passes through the cell membrane, this is a cancer cell, and then it's quickly effluxed out uh, before it has a chance to work. And so in this particular condition, you are administering a toxic substance to a patient that's really not working. When we bind docs to the nanodiamond, uh, which we call NDX, first of all, this is a very scalable process. I talked about scalability. If I were to email my students or postdocs right now to prepare a brand new sterile batch of NDX, within 15 minutes, they'll have a batch prepared, sterilized, and packed to send to a collaborator. Right? So it's, again, a very scalable material that we can work with. And the performance is very good. As I told you, the drug interaction with the diamond surface is so potent that early release is something that we really don't see. And I'll show you some data for that in just a little bit. Right? And again, I'll mention, you can achieve this type of interaction here and improved therapeutic efficacy against drug-resistant tumors with other nanoparticles. But again, when you think about the cost and all of the effort to move something towards a clinic, scalability matters and also the ability to systemically administer with minimal to no tox also matters. All right, so one of the first things that we did uh, was to look at uh, circulatory half-life. So one of the first phase uh, half-lifes we looked at, if you looked at drug alone, it's about 0.83 hours. Simply modifying or tagging with this carbon nanoparticle, we can improve uh, circulatory half-life about tenfold. If we look at intratumoral localization of NDX, you can see the solid lines in both the breast and liver model. This is the issue with resistance that we talk about. If you look at the dotted lines in these tumors, DOX goes in and then it just bleeds out quickly. And as I mentioned before, a lot of times DOX is highly toxic to the point where the drug can kill a patient, right, before the cancer does. So it's important to know that if you have a drug-resistant tumor, repeated dosing is not going to work, right? You need the tumor to retain that drug so it stays in longer. Another issue is that when we think about combination therapy eventually, right? If, if NDX ever becomes a component of, of combination therapy, a lot of the chemo right now is administered at what's called MTD, or max tolerated dose, right? So you can't keep adding this MTD of a drug that's essentially killing the patient as well. So it's important to think about a material that simultaneously looks at efficacy and safety. Before we move into efficacy, we looked also at myelosuppression. Myelosuppression is the dose-limiting side effect of chemotherapy. When the white blood cell count drops below threshold, you must stop treatment or else the patient can die, or this can lead to superinfections. If we look at this threshold level here, docs alone at 0 and 24 hours, there's no surprise. There's a clear level of myelosuppression. We compared this against doxel as well, which is the clinical nanoparticle standard for doxorubicin. This also had clear myelosuppression. But when we looked at NDX at 24 hours, there was no myelosuppression, which at the time was a little bit alarming to us because we thought, well, it's good that the stuff doesn't release early, right? Because we know it's stuck on the diamond. It's not systemically destroying the animal. But then we were worried because we wanted to know that the drug was actually eventually coming off because it has to get into the nucleus to cut up DNA and kill that tumor. Right, so when we started looking at efficacy, some good things happened. So this is 4T1, which is a very drug-resistant breast tumor. If you look at control and then docs at 100 microgram equivalents here, you can see really nothing's happening with the docs by itself, right? This tunnel staining at NDX at the same equivalents, you can see it's much more effective, and these are tissue slices of that breast tumor. If we actually look at tumor volume, this is control, this is saline, this is DOCS, and you can see here that the control at PBS and then DOCS alone, the tumor continues to grow, all right? So you can see that here as well. The tumor is actually pretty huge when administered 100 microgram equivalents of DOCS. NDX at the 100 microgram equivalents, it does better. Here you get these triangle plots here. So you can see that this delays tumor growth. Then the next thing we did was that we doubled the dose of DOX. If we doubled the dose of drug by itself, you can notice here that the animals all died early. They could not complete the study. But if we take NDX at this lethal dose of DOX, not only do all the animals survive, we get the smallest tumors observed in the study. Right? So this is all nice. I mean, here we can see that you know, we can further increase efficacy, but what we're interested in here is this improvement in tolerance of the drug. We've taken something that was completely intolerable. The animals all died early. Some of them had heart attacks immediately. 
And by simply tagging it with a carbon nanoparticle, uh, we can significantly improve animal survival. If we look at the survival curves themselves again, you'll know the blue and yellow star, this is doxalone 100 microgram and saline control. The animals pretty much die at the same rate. The gray star here is uh, NDX at 100 micrograms. You can see here that there's an improvement in survival. But if we double the dose, you can see the animals die early. In fact, the animals are worse off than if we just gave them saline and let the tumors grow. But if you take this lethal dose and you modify with nanodiamond, all the animals survive the study. And again, you get a clear improvement um, in efficacy as well. Um, after we did that, we actually, that was, an un, that was a passively targeted version of, of NDX, right? We uh, collaborated with Mike Bishop's group at UCSF, um, and we developed a liposome encapsulated nanodiamond where this is epirubicin with nanodiamond encapsulated with a liposome and uh, targeted with EGFR antibody. And you can see here, um, for controls, the tumors get larger. For the targeted tumors, the tumors regress to a point where they're no longer detectable. Um, if you look at the actual plots, the green plot's very similar to what you just saw before with docs. The animals die early with drug alone. But if you look at this plot down here, this is the targeted nanodiamond. You can see the tumors regress to a point, as you can again see here, where they're no longer detectable. So for NDX that's passively targeted, we get a very nice delay in tumor growth. For an actively targeted uh, nanoparticle, nanoparticle towards triple negative breast cancer, we get regression to the point of non-detection. All right, so I get a lot of questions about safety. I'm not gonna go over this entire slide, but we've looked at, we've done comprehensive studies looking at blood, urine tox. We've looked at clearance through the urinary system. We've actually done a CRO study, so third-party validation of nanoparticle tolerance at both low and high doses done by a lab actually here in Chicago. And all the studies with also a blinded histology exam by a pathologist, um, we can see that the nanodiamonds are very well tolerated. And I'll, towards the end, I'll kind of talk about where we're headed with that. Right, so the final part of the talk, we're gonna look at some brain cancer work done by Gui Fa Shi here. Um, a very nice collaboration with him and then Tad Tamita I'm at Children's Hospital. And so in this particular approach, we looked at a localized administration of NDX into the brain through convection enhanced delivery. This is not systemic delivery. This is a localized uh, delivery through CED, which has actually gone through clinical trials in humans, appears to, CED has been through clinical trials, not nanodiamond, but CED appears to be well tolerated uh, in humans. In this two models were looked at, C6 and U251, C6 is a rodent model, U251 is a more aggressive human model, a brain tumor. One thing that we wanted to look at in this particular approach here that Guayfa did was to look at um, localization and retention of the drug. We saw this with the liver and breast as well. You can see over the course of 6, 16, 24, and 72 hours in the, this lobe of the brain, if you look at drug alone compared to nanodiamond drug, you can see that the retention is better with NDX, and that's no surprise because we've seen that with other models. One thing of note is to also look at, if you inject the NDX into the right side of the brain, what happens on the left side of the brain, right? This is central nervous system. If you inject drug and it goes to the wrong side of the brain or it goes to healthy tissue, that tissue's not coming back, right? This is CNS. And so if we look at uh, resulting toxicity, if you look at control, Diamond alone, drug alone, and NDX, and we look at both lobes of the brain, you can see that when it's administered into the right lobe, for control and nanodiamond alone, left lobe is fine, as expected. When you look at DOX alone that's injected into the right lobe, the left side has clear edema and so on and so forth that's indicative of tissue damage, right? And that's bad. If you take NDX and administer on the right side of the brain, if you look on the left side, it does pretty well. And so it's important, again, when looking at breast can or, uh, brain cancer therapy to, do, to, to keep the drug retained within the right area. On another note for the breast and liver tumor uh, studies, when we also did that intratumoral retention study, we looked at toxicity in other parts of the body as well, and NDX certainly outperformed drug alone. All right, so if we look at the actual uh, animal studies here for efficacy, you can see control, diamond alone, drug alone and NDX, you can see that DOCS alone does a little bit better. NDX, again, does even further better. Now, if you look at uh, the persistence of luminescence of the tumor here, you can see that obviously NDX administered animals survive longer, which is shown through the survival curve here as well. 
If you look at the actual tissue here, again, looking at the controls, drug alone, diamond alone, and you look at H&E staining, as well as tunnel staining, um, NDX outperforms drug alone. And this is for the more aggressive U251 human model of that tumor. Right? If we look at the rodent model here, it actually, you see a very nice regression here. Right? So drug alone, again, does better, but NDX goes to a point where you see regression. You can't see the tumor anymore. And that's why when you look at this persistence of luminescence here, it's gone because the tumor's regressed. If you look at survival, uh, this is uh, significantly better as well when you compare NDX to drug alone administration. If you look at the actual tissue studies here, uh, tumors go from huge with the control to a little bit better with drug alone but NDX, you can't see the tumor anymore. If you look at the H&E stains as well, um, NDX outperforms drug alone. And if you look at the actual tunnel staining, again, NDX outperforms drug alone. All right, so this kind of uh, bring us th brings us to the end here of nanodiamond drug delivery. We've looked at, again, a number of other indications other than breast, liver, and brain. Um, but the overall theme here is that for drug delivery, um, we're really focusing on anthracycline delivery with nanodiamond. The reason for that, as I mentioned, is because it's highly scalable. When we look at systemic administration of anthracyclines, and we look at myelosuppression slash neutrophil count, and we look at toxicity in other parts of the body, NDX really does well, and we don't get that premature elution that one might expect, actually, with a, with a reversible absorption of that drug. For imaging, in collaboration with Tom's group, we've seen some really huge improvements in PERGAD relaxivity, right? So after all of this work, where are we now? And so, as I mentioned before, we've done a CRO study here in Chicago, which again, for those unfamiliar with CROs, it's a contract research organization. It's when a third party takes your material and validates it in whatever animal model you want. I um, mean, in our case, we looked at low dose, high dose, took the tissue, had a blinded pathologist come in and do the scoring of the tissue. And for all those studies, this appears to be well tolerated. With that data, we about four months ago started a non-human primate, so a monkey study to look at uh, toxicity studies, both again, low, high, low dose, high dose, dual gender. We also did an MTD study, a max tolerated dose study where we found at what dose um, were nanodiamonds lethal to the monkeys. We also did a no observable adverse effect level study as well to really start looking at what type of dosing we can give to a non-human primate. And we've also, as part of this four month study, we've already embarked on a chronic tox study uh, for both a one month, three month, and six month study to see how the animals respond, looking at tissue, looking at blood, looking at urine. From our initial studies, we can see that, again, the diamonds are well tolerated, as expected, just like what we saw with the CRO study with the rodents. Uh, we're also doing a canine PK study of NDX to get some better idea of the circulatory half-life in a dog model. And so in about 9 to 12 months, um, we ex we've already identified a phase 1 center that has agreed to undertake the first in-human study. Our first indication will actually be for liver. It'll be a localized um, hepatic portal vein injection for drug-resistant liver cancer patients. And so hopefully in about nine to 12 months, we'll have our first uh, phase one study for that. So that brings us to the end. I wanted to acknowledge all the people that make this work happen. This is my group. It's very dynamic. We've had new members since then. Uh, Laura did a lot of the work uh, here. Uh, she actually uh, just restarted her uh, MD portion of her uh, MD-PhD program here. She did a lot of that targeting work that we saw. Um, doctors Pierce Dorf, Huang, Zhang, and Kim as well. Um, Eiji Ozawa we work with. He's a nanocarbon expert in Japan. Mike Bishop's lab at UCSF. Ed Chow in Singapore. Several folks here at Northwestern. Guifa and Tad. A lot of the wonderful work with the brain cancer studies as well as our collaborators here at Northwestern and our support. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. I was wondering if your nano platform uh, could be used to deliver combinatorial uh, drugs, cocktail drugs. Great question. So that leads us to actually a whole area of research I didn't talk about today. So my lab is actually 50% nano, 50% combination therapy now. 
both with and without nano. All right, so if we talk about combination therapy, that's actually highlighted in that science translational medicine review. We have a whole section talking about, you know, nanoparticles have been very promising in the clinic already. Tonsillar cancer and other types of cancers where they can certainly shrink tumors, right? But the issue with cancer inevitably is resistance and recurrence. And so for combination therapy to attack that cancer from multiple targets, is inevitable. That's why there's a lot of uh, big regimens that are used in the clinic. So there's different ways to do it. You can take a nanoparticle and load a nanoparticle with multiple drugs, like an siRNA plus a small molecule plus a targeting agent. Or you can administer many types of nanoparticles, each functionalized with a different drug. And so when I talked about ideal nano platforms for specific indications, I truly believe that in the future, or even now, already there. Uh, there's work done at MIT, some really neat work on combination nanotherapy, where combination therapy will be comprised of different nanoparticles delivering different drugs. For example, gold nanoparticles delivering siRNAs, nanodiamonds delivering anthracyclines, and other particles delivering other drugs, because they're the best suited for that specific drug and that indication. All right, so our group is working on combination therapy, but, but before we get into combination therapy, Designing optimal combination therapy is challenging. And so that's an area that we're working on as well that's completely independent of nano, actually. And then now we're actually, once we've figured out a way to optimize that combination therapy, which we have, we're now starting to add nano back into it. So to answer your question, yes, we have worked with na combination nanotherapy. There's different ways to do it. One, one particle with many drugs or many particles, each carrying a drug. But beyond just having a combination, we're also toying with other ways to, to optimize that as well. But yes, it can be done. Contact lenses, is yeah. something doing that manufacturing now? So for the contact lens, the scale up for that, for that is not there yet. Um, one of the major issues with that that we were able to solve, but I know we can do better, is to disperse the diamonds better, all right? So, in terms of minimum levels of clarity, we're at a level where you know they're, 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 they're adequate. But again, these particles, once they get put into this matrix, they can aggregate. And once they aggregate, um, the, the last thing we want is an opaque lens. right? We also want to tune uh, the amount of drug that we have in there so we can get them to release as long as possible. Is there a manufacturer you're working with? Not supporting yet. You? So we're still trying to perfect the dispersal and scale up in our lab first, and then at that point, we'll, we'll talk to manufacturers. Sure, okay, so um, targeted, so the question was uh, differences between us and say a liposomal formulation, and then us for say, using diamond for nucleic acid delivery. So one thing we did look at, for example, was doxel delivery, okay, and it's resulting impact on tox to the animal, right? So for doxel delivery, we found that at 24 hours, there was a drop below threshold of myelosuppression, or, or white blood cell count. Um, and at that point, the treatment has to stop due to preventing superinfection and so on and so forth. Whereas in NDX, um, the, the interaction between docs and the diamond, in fact, there were some modeling studies done, is so potent that initial models indicated that docs would never release from the diamond, which is great for safety and terrible for efficacy, right? You, we'd have the most effective drug carrier that never releases, all right? But, after the model was further refined, when you add salt and water to this model, we can see that we know that the diamond interacts well with, uh, with water. And so this is competitive binding. So eventually, over time, the drug slowly comes off, which is very nice for circulatory or systemic circulation to reduce tox. But eventually, you'll pull in a tumor, the drug will come off, and you'll get that boosted efficacy. So in comparing liposomal with diamond, I think the safety right, is something where the diamond can do pretty well. For nucleic acid delivery, we saw some promising findings, right? So um, we were able to boost transfection efficacy up 70-fold um, without increases in tox, for example. We compared against lipofectamine as an example. But in that particular application, we needed to functionalize the diamond with polyethylene amine, which is a, which is a polycation, it's a, poly, it's, a, it's a polymer, where, you know, I think that from a scalability standpoint, um, from a standpoint of, we're, we were trying to model to see, is the diamond doing anything? Maybe stabilize that nucleic acid, because if it's not, 
then you could really do that with other particles. So Amy had some really neat work. We were able to see really nice improvements in efficacy for us. The effort we would need to do the scale up and to do the synthesis to see the improvement in efficacy, I think another nanoparticle might be better. So that, so if you look at that, that, uh, that Science Translational Medicine review, we really make the case for specific particles being better for specific indication, right? I think it's important to be honest and to think about, look, as nano continues to advance and to converge into the clinic, not every particle is gonna be optimal for every indication on the planet, right? Because from, a, from both the feasibility standpoint of a billion dollars to develop a new drug to really finding out where can this particle really improve, uniquely improve that treatment. Um, and so again, you know, nano diamonds were interesting, right, for, for gene delivery. And I think maybe there's more work to be done for therapy, but at least for our work, maybe it's useful right now at this standpoint um, as a reagent for us, for the nano diamond. Maybe later we'll push drug, uh, gene delivery further, but right now, because we're pretty far along, for anthracyclines, that's what we're looking at, and then also imaging. Great, thank you very much.